Hello and welcome everyone to the final session for the Fundraising Made Easy training series in collaboration with 50 by 40 and Apex Advocacy. I'm so, so excited to be here with you all and some of the wonderful funders and panelists that we have here tonight. And so you're in for a treat. <laughs> As a reminder, Apex Advocacy aims to increase the number of BIPOC individuals who participate in animal activism by advocating for collective liberation through animal rights, particularly in marginalized areas and communities that are disproportionately affected by the animal industrial complex. Said more simply, Apex Advocacy helps to recruit, embrace, and activate BIPOC animal advocates. And my role there is as the director of the Global Majority Caucus. My name is Brielle Ringer. So happy to be here with you all. And in that role, I am really with the caucus, which was first housed under Encompass and has found our new home at Apex Advocacy. And the Global Majority Caucus is really a space for Black, Indigenous folks of color and animal advocates to feel a sense of belonging. So in that role, I'm really in a position of deep listening to the needs of the community. And one of the needs that we hear over and over is challenges around fundraising. And so that's really how this series, this Fundraising Made e Easy series was born, was just listening to the needs of the community and wanting to help to address some of the gaps in understanding about fundraising. And so with our session tonight about pulling back the curtain on funder decision making. We are joined by some really wonderful guests who are going to give you the inside scoop, if you will. And we are joined here by Veronica Karai, Lauren from who is the partner and executive director of the Tipping Point Private Foundation. I'm just going to mute the background noise. Everyone, please make sure you're muted. Thank you. We have Tom Conger, Executive Director of Stray Dog Institute, and Lauren Kohler, the Director of Food Systems Philanthropy at Stray Dog Institute. And I just want to say a very warm welcome and thank you to all of the folks who are here with us, and especially the funders here who are going to be speaking this evening. What I really appreciate is just how thoughtful and intentional they have been preparing this session for you all to make sure it is incredibly informative for our movement as a whole, and that this will be a resource for the movement as a whole ongoing beyond this evening. And I'm really grateful because they've been thoughtful and considerate of big questions around equity in the fundraising space, about power dynamics, and not just to offer a here's how to play the game roadmap, what I have learned about them is that they are really open to a reciprocal conversation about how we can all do better to shift oppressive dynamics in the fundraising space and really build relationships that are rooted in care and trust. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it on over to Lauren to give a little bit more information and let each of the panelists speak about themselves and the orgs. Thank you so, so much, Brielle, for that super warm introduction. And I just want to say thank you all for so much for being here, whether it's seven o'clock at night for you, like it is for me in the Eastern time zone, or 5.30 in the morning. I am so appreciative of everyone who joined. It's really, it's really special to be here with everyone. And I also just want to express my extreme gratitude to Brielle and Christopher and the rest of the Apex team for making this series possible, and 50 by 40 also as a partner of this, um, as well as all of the previous presenters in this series. Um, Monica did an amazing fundraising 101, Uni and Megan did great presentations as well. And I hope that we can build on those conversations and you know build on their work as well. So, so we're just really, really grateful to be here with you all. Um, 
I can give a quick introduction of myself and Stray Dog Institute, and I'll let Tom add as well. Um, I'm Lauren. I know many of you. It's great to see some familiar faces or Zoom backgrounds here. Um, I'm the food system director of food systems philanthropy at Stray Dog Institute. Um, we're a private operating foundation focused on cultivating dignity, justice, and sustainability in the food system. And beyond funding, we also provide strategic research and opportunities for collaboration to our movement for farmed animal advocacy and and food system transformation broadly. Um, I'll just share briefly that our philanthropic priority is to strengthen and support the movement for farmed animal advocacy and food systems transformation. And while we have a central focus on issues of farmed animals and industrial animal agriculture in particular, we recognize that other issues are inextricably linked to animal advocacy, including climate change, biodiversity, human health, social justice, rural economies, I could go on and on. And this systems view is really foundational to the work that we do. Um, and I think Tom and my intention for this conversation is, you know, I think that there are a lot of unspoken dynamics and deep power dynamics and inequities within the system, the nonprofit industrial complex. And I'm hoping that this conversation tonight can kind of pull back the curtain um, and provide some transparency on how funders think about things, how funders make decisions, not to tell you how to do things, um, because I don't think our system is necessarily correct in the way that it operates, but just to show kind of what's happening behind the curtain in order to hopefully create a more equitable and inclusive movement for all. So that's that's my intention that I'm coming to this with. Um, and Tom, I'll let you briefly introduce yourself and add anything that you'd like to that. Uh, thank you very much, Lauren. I, uh, I um, would like to add that uh, we really feel a lot of gratitude toward funders. And I know sometimes there's this impression that um, you know, you think that you might be bothering a funder or um, uh, uh, being a pest or whatever it might be. In reality, you're doing a great service to us by helping us identify um, opportunities that are a good fit for us. Um, and I also feel like you're raising money for the movement. It's not just for your organization. Um, so every time you're knocking on doors and learning how to fundraise, you know, with us and with others, um, I think there's also an opportunity um, you know, that we feel like we're helping to encourage you to um, raise money for the movement as a, as a whole. Um, and uh, I am the executive director of Straight Dog Institute, if I missed that at the beginning. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. So nice to see so many familiar faces here. Thank you so much for joining this call. It's, it's very nice to see you all here. I'm Veronica Karai. I'm an executive director and partner of Tipping Point Private Foundation. Tipping Point is a small, uh, like I said, private foundation that values the power of global collective affected strategies. Uh, we consider if we collaborate, we will arrive quickly uh, to our main objective, which is to reduce or eliminate animal suffering. We, are, we hope to accomplish this uh, by funding projects we believe will, will be the most impactful, are likely to succeed, uh, otherwise neglected. Uh, and we value emerging uh, opportunities that contribute to uh, the elimination of factory farming. All of this, of course, include human animals. Uh, without you in the equation uh, and in collaboration, we will might never get there. Uh, and our intention here to add it to all the very well put words there from Lauren and Tom is uh, to make it uh, less about us uh, and, and more about you. And we're here, Tom, Lauren, and I, uh, to respond to your questions. Amazing. Thanks, Veronica. Um, I'll just add a little bit more maybe about our, and this is, was developed collaboratively conversations with us all together and with Brielle, um, our intentions for this conversation, building on what Veronica shared, I think that we're, we're aiming to be really authentic with you all here. And, and that, you know, means that we're going to be vulnerable with you all. So I hope that, you know, we can have some grace in this conversation and really have it be a space of mutual learning. Um, and like Veronica shared, have it be a very collaborative space. I think that, you know, we all three of us see ourselves as partners in the movement and um, 
Tom and I also see ourselves as, you know, in service of you all. So we're hoping that, you know, to approach this conversation in, in that way. Yeah, Veronica, is there anything that you want to add to that or Tom? Got to put you on the spot. Okay, amazing. Well, I think we wanted to start just by addressing some really important questions that we had. So first I'll say, we developed this webinar in collaboration with many of you who are here today. Um, I surveyed some of our trusted nonprofit partners asking what they'd like to see in this. They kindly responded with such thoughtful feedback. And then Brielle and the APEX team also put a, up an open call to anyone who had responded to this event and you posted questions online. We're very grateful for that. Um, so we wanted to start by answering a few questions together that we received about how we're approaching racial justice in our work, how are we supporting BIPOC-led organizations and folks of color in our movement. Um, so I want to touch on that first since this is an event hosted by APEX and it's also a really important conversation. Um, so Veronica, I'll let you start with this and then I can jump in and talk a little bit about how Street Dog Institute is thinking about these topics. That sounds good to you. Oh, thank you. The, um, well, it, this is a, the most important issue that we can talk about here and it is important to talk about it. Um, so we really wanted the three of us uh, with the help of Real, we, want, we really wanted to acknowledge the, pro, the issue and, and you know, racial biases, when you Google it, it says both personal and, in and institutional conscious and unconscious uh, biases creep into all the parts of philanthropic work and grant ma making process. Uh, if you Google that, that is exactly what it says. So what if you Google uh, BIPOC organizations and fundraising and bi with BIPOC organizations? So with that knowledge, we should all open the conversation um, and recognize the issue, uh, promote safe spaces like Apex uh, and, and Braille, where we're all a student and her work. We, we, uh, we think that we can learn from each other. Uh, so thank you, Braille, for offering this uh, a space to, for everyone and for for providing that safe space and allowing, allowing the conversation. Um, Lauren, you wanna add? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I think, you know, it's important to acknowledge the power dynamics here, right? Like mm -hmm. I, not only are we holding positions of power as funders, but some of us are holding positions of power as white people and those two things kind of combine. And so I just wanna be really, you know, intentional in acknowledging power dynamics and the racial dynamics that are present in these conversations and present in all of our work with our nonprofit partners in the movement. Um, and we're, we're working hard and trying to be very intentional about how to navigate those dynamics thoughtfully um, and intentionally. Um, so a few of the questions that came up on the submission page were related to how we're thinking about racial justice in our work and supporting work for racial, racial justice and supporting groups centering Black, Indigenous, and people of color in, their, in, in our work. Um, and so I wanted to speak to this from Stray Dog Institute side um, related to our work committed to racial justice. Um, so through from July 2021 through the present, um, we've set aside $100,000 a year um, for grant making to organizations in the farmed animal and food system transformation space that have a central part of their work related to racial justice in the food system. And um, some people ask, you know, how much of our grant making budget was allocated to this. I'm not at liberty to discuss our grant making budget in such a public forum tonight. I did want to share that number with you all. Um, and I also will share that 100% of those organizations are BIPOC led, 75% of them are women led. Um, and we also have other nonprofit partners whose organizations are BIPOC led or led by people of the global majority or doing work related to racial inequities in our movement as well that don't necessarily fit into this grant budget but are supported by our general grant making as well. So um, I wanted to share that. And Tom and I and our benefactors, Chuck and Jennifer, see this budget as a floor for our work, not the ceiling. Um, and there's a lot of room for growth and learning still for us. On a broader level related to inclusion and equity, and this will kind of this philosophy will kind of permeate all of the ways that Tom and I answer our questions here. We've been working really hard to embody the and implement the values and you know practices of trust-based philanthropy, which um, if you 
aren't familiar with it is an approach that recognize, recognizes that philanthropy is inherently built on a system of inequitable dynamics um, that you know, include economic dynamics, racial dynamics, and gender power dynamics. Um, and its aim is to reduce those power dynamics between nonprofits and funders so that they can enter into more open and hopefully more effective partnerships with one another. We've been very much on a constant learning journey with this and we still have a long ways to go, but um, we've implemented practices like, you know, providing things like support beyond the check when it's helpful to our movement partners, which is what it sounds like support beyond the check and that ranges from, you know, having people practice pitch something to us to reviewing a proposal for another funder. We've also shifted to moving to primarily unrestricted funding, which was a departure from our previous grant making strategy, reducing burdens and structures related to the vast majority of our grants, most of which have no um, reporting requirements, and doing more to promote transparency on our website. And our hope is that, you know, this will hopefully foster a more inclusive movement, you know, hopefully it's easier for our nonprofit partners to interface with us and to break down those power dynamics a little bit. So I don't want to go on too long, but I do want to share that we have tried to be very thoughtful when it comes to supporting folks of color, BIPOC folks, Black and Brown and Indigenous folks in our movement, and then also trying to center equity and inclusion and justice in our work generally. So I'll just, I'll just say that. Um, and Tom, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that, not to put you on the spot. No, that was wonderful, Lauren. Thank you. Thanks. I think as uh, we we also would like to add that we are here in representation of our organizations and and we don't represent all the funders in the movement. Uh, we are in hoping here to, to build a bridge that goes um, further than just intentions and, uh, and statements of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And instead, instead we, we would like to make sure uh, our mission is serving and including all the BIPOC individ individuals. So that is uh, our, our intention here as the, the, the two organizations. Uh, we recognize that there are many issues that we might not be aware of, uh, that we are in the learning process. We are all here learning. Um, the language might be uh, one of the many of those issues. So, um, and it could be perceived as a barrier and, and a cultural difference. We are not, at, we're, our intention is also not to push you to for perfection. Uh, we wanna communicate and, uh, and, and we're all in collaborating and, and uh, further your mission. Thank you, Veronica. So yeah, we just wanted to share that at the outset because it's an important conversation to have and just wanted to let you know it's top of mind for us. Um, but I would love to get into some of the questions that we had submitted now, if that sounds good to you, Brielle. Um, and Brielle has kindly agreed to ask the questions on behalf of our nonprofit partners who shared questions and kind of serve as a moderator. So thank you so much, Brielle. Yes, happy to. And just a reminder that we've received questions from a multitude of places in addition to some of the questions that you all have submitted using the form. And if you have additional questions going throughout, you can share those in the chat and I'll keep track of those going throughout in case we have some time at the end. Um, and if not, they have all agreed to help address questions that are unanswered by email within a week. Is that correct? Yeah, that would be great. We'll we'll do our best to answer all the questions that come in within a week. And I think Brielle is going to share our emails too when she sends that out. So if you'd like to connect with us one on one to talk about something um, that we mentioned today or something completely separate, we would love that. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Great. So let's start by speaking about how to approach funders for the first time and gain new funders interests and so there was a lot of questions around this topic and so what's the best way or time to approach a funder are there must do's and must don'ts and can you speak to your preferences here and what would be helpful for nonprofits to know um I will say, um, and, and I'll 
just a, a short sentence and then I will let Tom and Lauren uh, expand on it. Um, but warm introductions are always very helpful. Um, so if you have already uh, in your network one of the, the funders, you may ask them uh, if they are willing to, to introduce you to other funders in, the, in their network. That, so either way, through fellow nonprofits, also through a connection with the funders, uh, those are very, very, help, uh, very help, helpful way to connect. Yeah, I'll also add, I'm really repeating what um, Monica and hi Monica, I see you're on the call Ruth <laughs> shared in her in her um, fundraising 101. Um, Monica mentioned that, you know, when possible, other nonprofits can lift each other up and, you know, make those warm introductions where, where they can from a funder that they're connected with to someone who might not be connected with that funder. And seeing that as a benefit for the movement overall. And I know that, you know, I'm speaking from a position of privilege here as a funder, you know, asking you all to, you know, think about working from a mindset of abundance and a movement orientation. I know that that's not, you know, always possible, especially when you're trying to raise money. Um, but if someone is willing to connect you or if you're willing to connect a fellow nonprofit to a funder, it's a really great way to make a connection. And I think from a funder perspective, it actually looks really great too, because it shows that the nonprofit making that connection cares about uplifting the movement overall and, you know, wants to support their peers. So I think building on what Monica shared and what Veronica shared, um, those warm introductions, whether they come from funder to funder or connected nonprofit to funder are usually the best way to connect with people if you can get in, in that way. Yeah, Lauren, I, just to add to what you said, uh, there were a lot of nonprofits that at the end of the year uh, were not just raising money for themselves, but putting together a list of other nonprofits that they would recommend and encourage and just, you know, those organizations earn lots of points um, from my, you know, from from my perspective, um, because they're trying to build the movement as a whole, and they're not concerned solely about their their own organization. It might be helpful, you know, since part of this is about revealing, you know, uh, providing a behind the scenes view. When we're asked to make introductions to other funders, it's actually a pretty big ask, and I don't know if everyone always realizes that because. Um, in the same way that you have to navigate relationships with other nonprofits, uh, we have to navigate relationships with other funders. Um, there's, you know, we don't keep track of points or kits or favors, but, um, you know, there is, you know, some of that. You don't want to ask too much if you're not able to, to provide. Um, I find that it's much easier to pass along, you know, information or recommendation if the request is made really thoughtfully and, um, uh, with a clear intent of, of why another funder uh, would be interested in, in that nonprofit, right? So if it's a simple, you know, could you introduce me to all of your, you know, funder friends, that's one thing. But if you say, hey, you know, there are two organizations or three organizations where we think there's a lot of alignment, they have funded similar groups, but we don't have an end there. I think that we have a lot to offer. Would you mind doing an introduction? So it's a very specific ask. Um, if you can make it easy for us to pass along that request. So, um, you know, with some of the, you know, larger foundations that are used to doing this, they almost invariably provide a nice, you know, paragraph or two that, you know, I can adjust if I want, or I can just pass it along with all of their attachments. So it doesn't require a lot of um, preparation, you know, on, on my part. And then they're very clear. There's a bit, there's a, a link that you have to make between your nonprofit and the funder, and the more specific you can be about that, the better. Um, so it's, you know, we thought you might be interested in learning about this organization because it aligns well with and whatever it, it might be. Um, so again, the easier that you can you can make it. Um, for us, uh, you know, the more likely we are to, to be able to do that and on a more regular basis. One of the things that we often do as funders is we don't actually make the introduction directly until we've had an opportunity to uh, talk with a funder and see if they'd be interested in that. Because we don't want to put them in a position of having to say no, you know, by just all of a sudden sending them an email. Um, sometimes they let us know, hey, we're interested, but I'm short on staff right now. There's no way we can look at others. Or they might say, 
do the introduction in the fall because that's when we're evaluating other proposals. Um, but all that occurs behind the scenes. And then if we have the, you know, permission for that funder to make an introduction, you know, then then we'll we'll do that. Um, as a funder, when we're given those requests, we're having to balance, you know, the desire to be responsive to a fellow funder that, you know, thinks highly of enough of a nonprofit to say, hey, you should pay attention to them. You should, you know, learn more. Would you would you be interested? And then our desire, if it's not a good fit, you know, we don't want to waste the nonprofit's time. So we're all we're always kind of navigating that. Um, but I would say, you know, within the farmed animal advocacy movement and funders, that there's a lot of um, we get along really well. Uh, we're really comfortable saying, oh, this isn't for us. Um, so when you when you do get a yes from a funder that's been introduced to you, I think you should look at it pretty optimistically because they wouldn't take it out of, out of obligation. Um, and so I think that's, a, you know, it's a very encouraging sign. So it's kind of, I know it's more mechanical, but I think some of that information might be helpful, um, you know, in meeting other funders. Yeah, and to to other to add to that again to reinforce what you said, Tom, we we talk, we communicate <laughs> with each other. Um, so we ask for permission be, uh, before and making an introduction. Um, but don't don't hesitate and, and ask for and to ask for help. Um, I think that is important in the sense of collaboration. That's how we build the movement. How we we grow we grow as a movement. So ask for help. Um, but also don't take it personal. If personal, if we if somehow that funder was not available at that time, at that uh, at that moment, and if you receive a yes, um, respond with, uh, quickly and and be responsible in, in that response. Um, be informative um, because we we feel responsible to the. In the, the if we make the introduction, you will follow. <laughs> you will walk through. So um, and respect the the formal channels of communication. Once that fo that funder introduces you to another funder, put them on the um, uh, take it out of the email thread. So that way, <laughs> that person can constantly receive that that email and also continue the, the conversation, build into into that. Um, uh, relationship and 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 con and reach out to that uh, funder that we interest to you through that formal channel, which is usually email. Don't don't use social media. Um, those are not the most convenient way to reach out to a funder. Um, use it's better always to to use uh, your email. Your and then just to echo something that's, you know, we touched on earlier, um, don't be afraid to ask other nonprofits to make the introduction for you. Uh, I, I think uh, they earn a lot of credibility and favors and points, um, you know, by by doing that. Um, and particularly if, if it's more than just, uh, you know, a simple relationship, if there's some reason in particular why they should be introducing you. Either you, you share a similar theory of change, but maybe you're located in a different geography. Um, maybe you're a large organization and there's a smaller organization that's not getting the same level of, of funding that they deserve and pointing those things out are tremendously helpful. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do to make that easier, and we, we haven't done this in the past, but just making uh, available all of our grantee partners on our website I know that a lot of other funders in the space have already been doing that. We've started to do that. And, and part of our motivation is to help um, our grantee partners be begin to create connections and work together more and, and, and to collaborate more. Yeah, that was all wonderful. Um, I'll just add, you know, in terms of like when you start making that relationship or in advance of making that relationship, an expectation to have is that it's often helpful to cultivate 
relationships with funders over time. Um, and in Uni's presentation, he used this, he had this great graphic that was like, identify, cultivate, solicit, and think. And it was like the, fun, the funder cycle, I think is what he called it. Um, and, you know, he touched on how that relationship building and the cultivation of a relationship can be really helpful in, in building a successful relationship that will ultimately lead to the funding ask with a funder. Um, so, you know, I think in her presentation, Monica talked about a great way to meet funders who maybe haven't connected with before is at virtual or in-person events. Um, events nowadays have, you know, often have apps or software where you can see who's attending. Um, and if you look and you see there's a funder that you might be interested in connecting with, I think it's great to send them a message ahead of time and, and set up some time to chat there, um, which often feels better from on the funder side than, you know, kind of getting bombarded in person by a lot of asks. And if you are asking a funder in person, um, we think that the the way to get a yes or to start cultivating a relationship more easily is to ask, you know, would you like to learn more about my organization or my work? And can I reach out to you after the event or the conference? And that makes it really easy for a funder to say yes. And, you know, of course, they'd like to learn about your work. Um, and then it kind of takes the pressure off of you too in that instance to not like provide all the information up front, but to be able to, you know, once you get the yes, go back, do your research, see where there are points of connections, and then you can have more time to connect after that event is over. Um, so just wanted to just wanted to share that. And I think, you know, when when nonprofits approach us with a cultivation mindset, you know, wanting to have a genuine relationship. And obviously we recognize that there's a power dynamic at play and, you know, there's there's funding that they're hoping to get out of this relationship. We're not naive, um, but making it kind of too sales oriented can be a little bit of a turnoff. Um, but at the same time, it's important to actually eventually make the ask. I think that. As, as other present presenters have mentioned in past webinars, money can be a really hard thing for some people to talk about openly. Um, and that's very understandable. And I think some people can shy away from explicitly making an ask, but some funders will actually not recognize an implicit ask. They'll wait for you to make an explicit ask. And if you don't, they'll think that you're still in the cultivation stage of the relationship. So I think, you know, kind of trying to strike that balance between not being too sales oriented. If you have time to cultivate a relationship and get to know each other, that's usually feels best from our side but then also you know being being direct when you are making a funding ask comes across well cool i think we're ready to move on to the next question unless veronica or tom there's anything you wanted to add there wonderful so another popular question was how to connect with funders that are invite only how do you recommend getting a foot in the door with a funder who says they're invite only and don't accept unsolicited proposals is there an appropriate way to open the door to a relationship with them and are there ways to do this other than waiting for a funder to tap your organization or have an open call for proposals Well, uh, tipping point is uh, that does not accept uh, unsolicited proposals, and we recognize that it's difficult. Even and we have a contact us in our website uh, where you can send us a short message. Um, but again, use the the chat the the tools that you have available, like other nonprofits that might be collaborating with you and reach out to us. Uh, maybe do your research and and see if, if, if really your organization is aligned with our mission and a theory of change. Uh, send us a, a short statement, a, so, a short uh, introduction of your organization with a link of, of your website. and. We will, we will probably uh, respond to, to that message. Um, so we, we found there, we recognize uh, that lack of access is one of the biggest issues. Um, and we are working on changing those procedures or improving those procedures. That's great. Thanks, Veronica. I'll also add, you know, I talked a little bit about, you know, you can connect with funders at events. Um, I think finding ins other ways is possible too. We recognize that, you know, events are expensive to go to, a lot very time intensive. Um, they're well, virtual events is another way, but also raising your visibility um, within the movement so that funders have an opportunity to come across your work. Um, and like examples are like the fast list. A lot of funders are on the fast list. So, you know, 
we will see if your if your organization is posting about some great work that you're doing, um, or if you're a member of a collaborative that they might be supporting or know of, um, or you know there may be other opportunities where you can connect with a funder if they were featured in an article or they published something or um, you know they're they're being visible on an issue. Um, that's something that you could reach out to them on to start a relationship that isn't like a direct funding ask. So kind of finding creative ways to find that in can be can be helpful, even if a funder, you know, you're not you're not soliciting funding directly. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, Tom provided an example to me where he learned about an organization on the fast list and attended a few of their webinars and now they're in the queue for potential funding from us. So it's definitely possible to, to get on funders radars in other ways, even if you're not, you know, attending conferences or virtual events where you're able to connect with them directly, because I know that that can be challenging. Yeah, Lauren, just to, to build on that, I think it's important to know why funders may, um, uh, be invitation only. Part of it could be they've been in the movement for a long time. They have a hundred plus nonprofits that they're already supporting, um, and they don't want to set up this expectation that you know they're giving lots of new grants every single year. They want you to be able to focus your time and attention where you're most likely to get funding. Um, I make a distinction. I think you should make a, a, a distinction between making an ask and getting on someone's radar. Um, uh, because I don't think we're saying we don't want to hear from anybody, you know, if you're invitation only. It's just, I think we're saying we're not prepared to accept unsolicited requests for money. Um, so I think it's perfectly fine, at least from my, my point of view, to say, you know, to a nonprofit or to a funder, I know that you're not taking unsolicited proposals, right? So you're acknowledging that you understand what the rules are. But I think we're an organization that you would like to learn more about. Would you mind if I sent you a, a, a two pager and um, maybe I can just keep you updated on you know, our activities over the next year or two? So it takes a lot of the pressure off. They know that you're not asking for money, but you're starting to cultivate that uh, relationship you know, early and, and give it time to, to develop and, and mature. And then invariably a lot of times, you know, a year later, you know, 18 months later, you get a tap and they'd say, I'd love to, I'd love to learn, I'd love to learn more. And I'll just share, you know, like Veronica said earlier, we are only representing ourselves. So other funders may feel differently about this. So please don't be discouraged if, you know, you do that. And then someone responds and says, sorry, we're not accepting unsolicited proposals, but um, I think that's helpful insight. So thanks for sharing that, Tom. Do you all have any thoughts on when it makes sense for orgs to be spending time fundraising from foundations versus small dollar donations from public support or events like VegFest even? Well, you know, I think something to keep in mind is that um, it's really not either or, like just because you start off raising, you know, money from friends and family and small donations, 10, you know, 25, $50 doesn't mean that ever goes away, even if you're working with high net worth individuals or a family foundation or a larger foundation. Um, you know, so I think you continue to do to, to do all of those. Um, I, I also think it's really important for organizations to recognize where their funding is coming from. You know, it's it, often 10 to 20% of your donors are providing 80% or so of the, you know, the funding. Um, it's great to keep going back to them, uh, you know, year after year and sometimes asking them to, to contribute a little bit more, but making sure that you're, you know, the only, you don't want the only interaction with that donor to be when you're asking for money. So there's things you, you need to do, you know, in, in between uh, to nurture that, to nurture that relationship. Um, there are also uh, pooled funds that are available that have formal application processes. Um, it's a it's a great way, um, you know, to to easily get your name out there um, because multiple funders are often you know looking at at those opportunities. Uh, Megan Lowry, who did one of the earlier webinars, wrote a great piece on our blog about pooled funds, um, and and you can check it out. Um, we we'll, can provide the link in the follow on on materials, but that's a another great place to, you know, to look for funds. Um, things like VegFest and events can be helpful, but if you're going there just to find donors, it's, you know, my gut says it's probably not the right place, but if you're looking for volunteers, 
um, you know, you're looking for, you know, donors, there's other objectives in being there, then, then sure, you know, that, you know, that makes sense. And then, of course, there are some events, you know, um, you know, AVA is, is, is one of them uh, that a lot of funders attend. It's, it's a great place to, to go. And they have, um, you know, they usually have conference software that allows you to reach out to the funders in advance and request a meeting. And we're there to, to meet more nonprofits. Um, so th those are some great opportunities. Hope that's helpful. Uh, I think uh, all of this um, and this fundraising, uh, this, this question can be applied in different and not interpreted in different ways, right? And, and depending on the side of your organization, what is useful. Um, fundraising can also be an, an in-person events, a tool for you to use to, to grow and, and to, uh, to continue your learning process and how to be effectively connect with funders. So if you use it that way, um, trying to use those events and, and those tools to, to, to create a deeper sense of community about the, uh, among the partners that you have in your organization, those could be donors, volunteers, advisors, um, have going through that process, it could give you a better understanding of how better communicate the goals of your organization. And once you are in front of a funder, you will have a better sense of what is effective, what is the best way to communicate your mission and strategy. So use all the tools available. Go out there, expose yourself, expose your organization, practice <laughs> and then you will feel more confidence uh, when you're in front of, uh, of a, a big donor or a small donor um, but it's all part of the learning process so if there is a right answer here is use whatever tool is available to you to raise awareness about the work that you do mm. thank you all and how should organizations deal with funders where they maybe submitted a pro proposal and got declined but aren't sure why, or they submitted a proposal and haven't heard back from the funder? Can you provide some insight on these scenarios from a funder perspective and share any recommendations that you might have? Yeah, we got this question several times, which makes me think that it's happening more often than it should. Uh, so that's sad. I'm sorry that that's happening to folks. Um, I think there are a few different possibilities that could lead to this outcome. One is that funders work on slower timelines than I think some nonprofits expect. I am, will say I'm definitely guilty of this myself. Um, and so I think that that is a, like a real difference maybe between funders and nonprofits. It's just that funders sometimes take a little bit longer than uh, nonprofits do. Um, in addition, sometimes the person that you're in contact with is not the holder of the wealth. For example, you know, Tom and I work for Chuck and Jennifer Lau, our benefactors, who are the people who ultimately make the decisions about the grants that Stray Dog Institute makes. So there's often a process where folks have to communicate with other people. And some organizations even have a board or a steering committee that makes decisions about funding. Um, so there may be kind of an internal process that they have to go to, through. And hopefully a funder would communicate that to you up front so you could kind of understand the expectations. But if that's not the case, um, that may be happening. Um, and then in addition, if someone is presenting something to a committee or to benefactors, they might be thinking about how to present an organization in a way that helps put that organization with its best foot forward that would appeal to the, the decision makers. Um, so, you know, a program officer or, you know, a staff member like Tom or, Tom or myself might be actually making an investment of time and thinking about and strategizing how to help an organization or how to help position an organization or pitching an organization to their decision makers. So often there's, you know, several pitches that happen um, between you talking to a program officer or someone working at a funding organization and the final decision maker. Um, I'll also just say Tom and I think that like two weeks is generally an acceptable time frame in which funders should get back to you. You should not be waiting for more than a month. I think that's out of the ordinary. Um, so, you know, just 
to set expectations. I think there are a lot of unspoken expectations within within this kind of space. And so I think two weeks is kind of a, a good a good like, you know, expectation to have. Um, if you're not hearing back, if you're really not hearing back from an organization, um, we think that if there's a really good match between yourself or your organization and a funder, you're likely going to hear back. Um, that's the norm and that's the etiquette within the space. Where you're most inclined to not hear back is if it was a long shot anyway, um, if your work was really not connected to you know, the types of work that they fund. Um, it might be that funders are getting six, seven, eight, nine, ten unsolicited proposals a day, a week, and they they may not be able um, or they may not, you know, have the bandwidth or capacity to get back to all of the folks who reach out to them where there's there's not a, you know, a real good opportunity for a relationship there. Um, also just say that when we have to say no to a group, um, for whatever reason, it's a really good opportunity to ask us why. And I would recommend that um, anyone do this with funders that they feel comfortable doing this with, recognize that there's power dynamic and that can feel uncomfortable. But where funders can provide you additional information that might help you better position yourself with the next funder or understand why that no happened, I think that's really valuable information. Um, and you know where they can provide a thorough explanation it can it can help you hone your pitch for the next funder um i think also you know when receiving a no it's not an opportunity to make a second pitch it's important to kind of respect that decision and an opportunity to learn rather than pitch yourself again um, yeah and if and generally as veronica has said if you're unclear about what to expect ask um i think there's no harm in asking and funders will be happy to provide that information to you and sometimes it can be really helpful to like prompt that conversation for example if you're in a conversation with a funder and things are starting to wrap up you could offer you know would it be helpful for me to reach back out in two weeks and that funder might say yes thank you that would be so helpful that'll help you help me keep you at the top of my inbox or to-do list so that can be that can be like kind of a helpful trick too to make sure that people are getting back to you in a timely manner. Yeah, absolutely. That was very clear. And again, yeah, we all have very different timelines between funders and in relationship with with nonprofit. Um, I think clear expectation is the best to have a clear communication. Once you have the opportunity to be in front of that funder. Um, please ask what would be was it appropriate to to go back to to reach out again to that person to that funder also uh, sometimes this might bear more we might bear more responsibility than you on this uh, but we know and we should be more uh, responsive right Sometimes, and because of the time aside are different and the size of the organizations are really very, very, very different, different. it takes different times right, to, to respond. Um, I think uh, also what is important for you is to have, and when you have that clear communication with the funder, to have an, a, very, a good understanding of if you need an answer of a commitment for a grant, or if you need the funds. So uh, if, if that is community, communicated clearly and, and when you need it, and when you're expecting that, that answer, everything in the communication process, it will be easier. So have all that in mind when you're having the communication with a funder. Thank you. And what about how might orgs deal with funders who aren't interested in funding infrastructure? So should orgs that need general operating funding ask for this directly from funders? Yes, I, I feel strongly on this one. I think that funders can do a lot better. And I think fortunately this is changing. More funders are providing general operating support, but I think that's, I think that's thankfully becoming more of a norm. Um, but I think that you know more funders could be offering general operating support and unrestricted grants. Um, I think you know this can connect to you doing the homework before you meet with an organization. Some funders will say on their website whether they provide more unrestricted grants or project-based grants. We say that on Stray Dog Institute's website, um, so that might help you kind of determine whether 
they're, they could be a fit for, you know, a project or an unrestricted grant. Um, you know, I think that something that Tom shared with me and that he might reiterate through here is to, it's helpful, I think, to kind of make the ask for the like outcome or the movement that you would like to have, or, you know, to, you know, make the ask in, in a way that's in line with the system that you're trying to create. So, you know, if general operating support is the default for your organization for other funders, I think that's something to share with a, a funder is to say, you know, we have many other funders who have been kind enough to provide general operating support. That's worked really well for our organization. And we would love if that were possible for our support from your organization. If that doesn't resonate with you or doesn't feel right, we're more than happy to discuss a specific project. But you know, if your organization, and I think most organizations do, need general operating support more than project-based support, I think that that's perfectly fine and actually really helpful to set norms like that in conversations with funders to kind of move us all towards a system that you know gives nonprofits the support that they need um, to to make their work happen. Um, so yeah, I think I'll I think that's all I'll share on that one. But I hope that more funders will continue to provide general operating support. Um, I think what is important here is for you to be transparent on your financial statements of so of, of the budget of the organization. If you're making a proposal for a unique uh, project, you can also share. You should also share. Uh, your how is it your the financial uh budget for for the organization how healthy is the budget for the general operation of the organization of course if we see some gaps in the general operations budget we will we will know that you're not going to be able to uh, able to perform effectively in a specific project so that is also part of the same of the question that you they the as before, it's part of communication. Communicate, ask questions, um, and be clear and honest about the situation of a financial situation of the organization. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, moving along. So many great questions in here and so much great insight. Let us know if you're still with us in the chat <laughs> and remember to let us know if any other questions come up, but they're answering so many great questions already. Um, going into the funding relationships and really navigating honesty and communication funding relationships, on a basic level, different funders have different expectations for communication and follow-up. Oftentimes, however, those expectations are not clearly communicated to grantee partners. How should nonprofits navigate establishing communication norms with funders? Is there a specific frequency at which orgs should communicate with funders? Are there expectations in terms of communication that you understand as norms? Yeah, I can speak a bit to this. I This is a great question and something that I feel particularly strongly about. I think that, you know, having these unspoken expectations is something that perpetuates inequities in our movement. So I think it's really important to be, speak these things out loud. And I think that that's sometimes hard because it, from my perspective, the funder nonprofit relationship does not always like work in like the most like perfect way, right? Like I think that a reality that we recognize is that this work is really relationship based and requires an you know an investment of time and from my perspective in an ideal world it would be amazing if nonprofits could just get the money that they need to do their amazing work and not have to worry about spending time on raising funds but unfortunately that is just not the way humans work humans are relation based and humans who work at a foundation level are no different um, so, you know, first of all, again, if you don't know what the expectations are around communication, what a funder prefers, just ask. Um, it can be as simple as saying, you know, how often would you like to hear from me? I'm happy to reach out, you know, once a quarter, whatever. If you have a newsletter that you regularly publish, you can always ask a funder if they'd like to subscribe to that to stay up to date. With your work. That's something that I like to do with a lot of our nonprofit partners because it, it takes the burden off of them a bit. Um, they're already publishing it. Um, I think that, you know, this work is really relationship based and, you know, 
funders like to have a relationship with the nonprofits that they're supporting. So, you know, it's not an obligation from our side, but if someone, you know, we give a grant and then we don't hear from them for a whole year until they're asking us again for a grant, it feels a little bit less natural. Um, and it's a missed opportunity to cultivate a relationship from our perspective. Um, so, you know, in that scenario, we may still say yes to a grant, um, but it just doesn't feel as, as natural. And I think that, you know, Tom and I discussed how we'd respond to these questions and cultivating these relationships with funders does not need to be super time intensive. I recognize that it could become that when you have relationships with lots of funders, um, but it could be, you know, one to two to three touch points throughout a year, um, you know, to engage with a funder in a way that feels, you know, more one-off, less performative, less form language-y. Um, some opportunities that are really great kind of touch points with funders are when your organization maybe has a really big success, something that you want to share. That's a great opportunity to reach out to a funder and just say, hey, just wanted to share this with you. Um, or if you see something that they've written, like let's say they've written a blog post, there's always an opportunity to say, oh, I really liked this post that you wrote. Um, I think that while this requires an investment of time and effort, um, it does get us away from this accountability mindset and into a more relationship mindset of, you know, cultivating a relationship between your organizations and a partnership between your organizations rather than reporting to a funder all the time and then keeping you accountable. Um, so I think that, you know, that's a change in dynamic that it might be helpful to think about. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's an imperfect system and it requires an investment of time, but I think those are maybe some helpful tips from, from our perspective. Yeah, I agree with everything. And now we'll just add a little thing for you to consider. Um, we as funders, as funders, we we need to know how effective our given uh, has been in order to better inform future fit given. So it's also it's a it's a two way row here. It will benefit you and, and it benefits us. So, so we need um, your the, the connection with you. We need you to be responsive. We need you to tell us how things are going. Otherwise how we are going to better inform future grants, uh, future decisions about future funds. So uh, keep in touch, communicate, use, use all the advice that Lauren just ha have said. And um, yeah, don't, don't disappear. <laughs> Excuse me if it takes me a little bit to mute my computers, you know, trying to keep up with all of the goodness that's going on over here. <laughs> <laughs> but we're back in action. So much of the work in the animal advocacy and food system movement involves long-term systemic change. How can nonprofits engage in honest conversations with funders about expectations around timelines and impacts that might not fit into the typical grant reporting period? I can take this one first, if, if that's okay. I, um, you know, I think most funders have that long-term mindset to begin with. I, I know that sometimes, protect, particularly in the EA community, I, there's this perception that it all has to be measurable in certain time frames and the number of animals. But uh, I, you know, I think even EAs have a very long time frame. And I think one of the reasons that they're actually motivated to do the work that they're doing and the type of work that they're doing um, is because they know that it's going to be decades and decades and decades to get to where we, you know, we, we want to be. So um, I would lean into that. Um, and I would not become, you know, preoccupied with measures and accountability. Um, you know, we can do X by a certain date. Uh, I, I think that you want to say up front, we take a long-term perspective. We think that most funders in the space take a long-term perspective. We think that you're that way as well. Um, you have to rely on your theory of change to be convincing. So it's not about, you know, how many people will see the movie and then become an advocate or change their diet. Um, it's really about, um, you know, this conviction that someone has that, you know, you know, for example, if we're talking about movies, when I ask other advocates, 
you know, how they came to the movement. They often mention a book or a movie. Um, and so I can, I can use that as a way of validating my theory of change of, of what makes a difference. So when you, when it's hard to measure things, make sure that you're confident, enthusiastic and convincing within your, within your theory of, of, of change. Um, and then, you know, I, just, to, just to reiterate, I, I think that, um, you know, whenever you can lean into the system that you want to create, the, the better. And so being explicit about, you know, wanting funders to take a longer, longer term perspective, I think that really helps the movement as a, as a whole. Wonderful. Um, some progressive foundations and funders approach grantees with flexible or minimal reporting requirements. Have you seen any notable examples of creative reporting styles or techniques which appeal to your institutions? Yeah, I can I can take a start on this one. So I mentioned trust based philanthropy earlier. There are a number of different philosophies that have, you know, blossomed. Trust based philanthropy is not the only one. In Monica's presentation, she mentioned community centric fundraising. There's also um, um, EPIC, which is it's an acronym and I'm forgetting what it stands for, but that has been, um, you know, pioneered by Vu Li, who is the great author of Nonprofit AF and someone that I really respect. Um, so anyway, there are a lot of great resources and a lot of very, you know, people who are thinking about totally changing the dynamics, the power dynamics and the approaches between, you know, nonprofits and funders to help us work better together. Um, I think in trust-based philanthropy, something that we have really put into practice is being very flexible with reporting requirements. 80% of our grants or so are below $10,000. So we have a small, smaller level grants um, and because partially because those grants require less due diligence, um, we require no reporting requirements um, for, for those grants. We really want our nonprofit partners to focus on doing their work and not wasting their time on us. Um, and we try to do our homework and keep up to date with their work as best as we can following, you know, their newsletters or, you know, seeing their annual reports if they publish those or keeping up with them on the fast list. Some funders will also, and this is something that we're trying to do where there are reporting requirements, be very flexible about what those are. So something we try to offer is we're really flexible in terms of what reporting requirements are. We basically want to, you know, say hi to our nonprofit partners with grants above $10,000 a year, once a year. And, you know, that could be reading your annual report. That could be having a 30 minute phone call with you. That could be you recording a voice memo and sending it to us. We want to be really flexible about what fits your abilities and bandwidth and, you know, preferences best. And I think that I've seen some other funders engaging in trust-based philanthropy take that approach too. Um, so I think that's one way. I People are being really creative. I'm sure there are things that people are doing that are much more even creative than that, that I haven't seen. Um, and I think something else that can be helpful is when funders will accept proposals written for other funders. And that's something that we do. So if you have a proposal or a report um, that you've written for another funder, we'll often say, if you want, just send it to us. You don't need to change anything on it. We don't care if it has, you know, dear so-and-so on it. And it's not near Tom. Um, we're happy to, you know, take those into and, and appreciate getting to learn about the work. Um, and I think that, you know, that's kind of a general trend. It seems to me that a lot of foundations and funders are thinking about this. Um, and our hope is that, you know, the time that that saves nonprofits hopefully opens up more opportunities, not only for them to do the important work that they're doing first and foremost, but also to have more time and capacity to nurture actual relationships with their funders rather than just worrying about being accountable to them all the time. So instead of jumping through all of these hoops, how can we build a relationship that is more meaningful and like mutually helpful? Um, I think that that's something that we feel really strongly about is we don't just want to be like a resource suck. We want to be giving back um, to our nonprofit partners, hopefully in ways beyond the check. Um, and so, you know, this may free up some ability to engage in helpful conversations with funders. So. I don't know if that's if that's helpful at all, and or Tom or Veronica, if you want to add anything to that. But I think this also falls into communication and set clear expectations of what you and the funder wants to come out of the out of this relationship, right? So, um, so yeah, everything that uh, Lauren had said is very useful.
Briella's back. Amazing. There it is. Yay, Briella's back. Our hero. <laughs> Our leader. Let me get everything back in action here. Okay, get myself. Back is so fun. Love it. <laughs> right. Okay. Did I cut anyone off? No, no you're I perfect. think we're good. Yeah. We okay. Can move perfect. into the next question. Great. I also wanted to mention that I saw Megan share in the chat for anyone who's watching the recording and won't see the chat that Megan also recommended that you could share videos that are three minutes or less as another way of like staying in communication and giving updates. Yes. Send me a TikTok. So <laughs> in any way that is helpful for you that it is easier for you to communicate with with the funder you know and just continue cultivating that relationship i'm here for tiktok reporting all right making that in my notes <laughs> um all right let's talk about money with funders we received a cluster of questions around do's and don'ts for talking to funders about money first should nonprofits ask funders for a specific amount or is that a faux pas and relatedly should a nonprofit go back to a funder and ask for more money in the current year or is this not a good move I can answer some of those. Um, it really depends on the funder whether you should ask for a specific amount. I know that there are some funders in the space that they don't want the nonprofit to ask for, you know, X number of dollars. Others like that guidance. Um, and there's certainly different ways of going about it. Uh, you know, it, it, from the funder's point of view, what they're trying to determine early on in the process is how much money is this fundraiser or nonprofit asking of me? Is this a $2,500 ask? Is this a $25,000 ask? Is it a $250,000 ask? Um, and the doing things that help us find that anchor point is really helpful. In, in Megan's presentation, she talked about putting your annual budget, you know, in the top right-hand corner, because that's really important to her, because depending on the size of your organization, that's probably going to give her an indication of the size of the ask. Uh, uh, some folks will let us know what their budget is and what they want to do in the upcoming year and what their gap is. So if I know that there's a $200,000 gap, uh, they're probably not asking us to fill the whole gap, but at least I know, um, you know, what, what the range is, you know, within that. Um, You know, one, yeah, another question that you asked was about the, the timing. I think if we were to say yes to an organization, um, we wouldn't expect another ask for a year. Um, most, found, you know, most funders have a, an annual cycle. Sometimes they actually do certain types of grants every quarter, like we might do uh, legal and policy grants in the first quarter and grassroots organizations in the second. Not all, you know, we don't necessarily do that, but there are some that, that do that. The only, the only exception might be if you know there's a new opportunity that presented itself um, that you didn't know going into the year or a, a new threat or a funder pulled out um, so you know my I, I think one of the things that you run the risk of by coming back with a second request one it could sound ungrateful um, like you know you ask us for money we gave you money and, and now you, you're coming back so soon um, then I think you also have you run the risk of being perceived as not, um, uh, you know, potentially planning as as well, right? So if, if you knew at the beginning of the year what your budget was and your gap and, um, you know, everything was falling into place, why would you have to come back to us uh, again? So it carries, it does carry a little risk, but if there are good reasons for it, um, and you can explain that, certainly, you know, certainly reach out. Yeah, we are here to fund your work. So if we don't talk about money, there's no way that we can fund your work. So yes, we need to talk about money. Um, and we and you need to understand that most of the organizations use different ways to, to have access to those funds. So most of the time we need time and we allocate those funds throughout the year in different ways. So um, most of the time we, um, we have are the same as you, a budget for grants. So um, yeah, we have to have a clear understanding of what's your, your expectation of funds. 
Um, and but again, about communication, if you have, if you run into a unique opportunity and you need X amount of extra funds, communicate it with us. Uh, but always be prepared. Your financials and um, and your strategy should be clear and and transparent. Thank you. And we have some additional uh, suggestions in the chat. Megan, thank you for being here and also offering your supportive feedback here. So you can also uh, consider a passive or gentle request in your language, which might sound like I wanted to inquire if we could apply for additional funding because of XYZ. And you can also um, ask for levels of funding. So if you want to direct ask, you could do like a low, middle, and high range of um, requested funds. Okay, is it appropriate to ask a funder about what their policy and intention is regarding continuing annual grants? Um, I think that um, you can. I think you have to be careful not to put them on the spot. Um, so one of the ways that you might do, you know, one of the things that you might say is, um, what percentage of your new grantees uh, are funded in subsequent years? Um, what might make it more likely uh, for us to receive funding in subsequent years? Um, lean into the aspiration of multi-year funding. I, I think it, it doesn't hurt to say, we know a lot of other funders are making multi-year commitments. We know not everyone can do that at that point, but you know, please consider us for, for multi-year funding if you can. Ask, uh, don't, but don't take it personal if you receive a no for an answer. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you don't ask, you're not gonna have no other answer. So uh, I think it is, is uh, appropriate to uh, just to ask the question. I'll just add really quickly. I think that many funders are recognizing multi-year commitments as a best practice. That said, there are some funders who would love to give multi-year commitments, but whose funding year to year is based on their investments in the market. And depending on how well the market is doing, that may determine the level of their giving ability the following year. So it can be hard to make commitments, you know, especially if they're a funder at a smaller level. I don't think, you know, huge foundations have this issue necessarily as much. Um, they're, you know, they have, you know, if you're like a hundred million dollar foundation, then you might not have this issue. But, um, you know, that's kind of a behind the scenes thing is that many funders, um, you know, have budgets depending on the market and they might know that they you know have a core amount that they're going to be able to give to the next year but not sure how the market is going to treat them beyond that so um so yeah that's just an additional kind of nugget great and in terms of evaluating impact i'm really excited about this question this is something uh i know we talk about a lot within the global majority caucus and so what kind of achievements and successes do you like to see from your grantee partners how do funders measure the impact of the initiatives that they support and what impact would they like to see from nonprofits yeah, I can start on this one. Um, Tom and Veronica jump in. I think at a, at a foundational level, no pun intended, um, I think what a funders are wondering is, you know, we wrote a check to this group, are they making a good use of that money? Is Was it a good investment? Um, and I think, you know, from my perspective, Stray Dog Institute really relies on organizations to set their own goals and show us how they're having impact on their own terms. Um, I know that different funders have different philosophies on this, but I think, you know, if you talk about all of the things that you were able to accomplish and how that connects to your goals and your theory of change, even if you weren't able to link it to, you know, a, a specific number of animals or a certain quantifiable outcome, that can show a funder that, you know, it it had a meaningful impact. It was it was a good investment. Um, and where you can quantify, that's great. Um, but you know, sometimes it's just taking advantage of the energy or the unquantifiable outcomes that your work has had over a year and sharing that with a funder. And there's so much value also in reporting on like a dynamic basis, like we touched on before. You know, if you have a really big win, or even if it's a small win that you're very proud of, that's that's something that can show that impact to a funder too. Um, and, you know, 
impact determined determined on your own terms, I think is, is something that I'm very supportive of. When you wait to do it at the end of the year, you know, in like an annual report, those are valuable and great. And I really enjoy reading them. Um, but it can sometimes feel like more of an accountability measure rather than like a relational kind of thing or sharing, sharing wins when they, when they happen. Um, for specific funders, you know, in terms of talking about impact, you can also highlight things that you know that they're interested in, like for example, you know, Stray Dog Institute takes a food systems lens to our work. So let's say your organization took, you know, a food systems approach to farm animal advocacy in some way. That could be something really great to share with us to, you know, kind of amplify how you're communicating that impact. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's all I have to share. Oh, one additional thing is that I think Monica in her presentation, um, I'm, I was a big fan of all the presentations. Um, shared that each each funder has their own theory of change and their own objectives, just like every nonprofit in our movement does. And so, you know, they're supporting nonprofits work in order to reach their objectives. And so, you know, you're helping them reach their objectives when you're sharing your impact. And I, I hope that that can be, you know, empowering because you're, you're doing your own work, but you're also, you know, helping a funder, you know, support the work that they want to see in the world. Yeah. No, uh, sharing and, uh, and measuring impact is important. And, and as this, uh, Lauren says, it's important for us to understand how we are growing in the movement, how, how effective we are all working on this uh, together. So I think it is important, but it's very difficult. Uh, there, are some, there are some initiatives that are very difficult to measure, and there are some that are impossible to measure. So measuring impact is important but that doesn't mean the funders consider that we are you know adverse to to high risk not all of us are like that and and we we take opportunities that are high risk um and that it can be byproducts of different initiatives we know that we aim with our strategy to end factory farming but in the way to there, it could be just to, to uh, raise awareness about changing diets and that measuring that impact directly toward how many animals you save is very difficult. But we know that the end result is to reduce uh, animal suffering. So take out that in consideration. Uh, it's not a hard uh, science, um, as you say, it's, it's not all mat mathematics, it's just communication and trying to, and that communication to effectively communicate, uh, co communicate to, to <laughs> repeat it again, to trying to transmit what is it that you're doing uh, with your work. Okay. In the interest of time, we have actually a few more really great juicy questions and responses, um, but we're going to send those out as we shared in, uh, by email, uh, just in the interest of time, but there'll be even more great information for you in the follow-up email after this event. But I want to jump down to the last question that we want to be sure that we get to this evening. And so... In terms of fostering nonprofit collaboration, how can nonprofits collaborate with other nonprofits within a funder's portfolio? How are funders thinking about fostering this collaboration and how could both parties do more to foster it? So sorry, Brielle. I was actually thinking we can, we'll be sure to answer that over email. <laughs> Would it be okay if we talked about collaboration among funders? This was a topic that we got a few questions on and I would I think it would be helpful to address in, in person. Um, sorry, sorry yeah. for the confusion. And that's the collaboration among funders question. I'm seeing it now. Yes, absolutely. Okay, just kidding. Um, so actually, broadly, can you speak to what extent funding is coordinated <laughs> with other funders, for example, like through forms like uh, farm animal funders? Do funders exchange notes with each other about organizations? If an org messes up with one funder, can that impact their chances of receiving funding or their relationship with other funders? Yeah, 
thanks Brielle. We are trying to make this as conversational as possible, but we have like a 10 page notes document. So I appreciate everyone's patience. Um, I think the short answer is yes, we do coordinate and talk, but we are not a cabal. Um, Farmed Animal Funders is not used for the purpose of funders talking to each other about different organizations. We really don't do that. Um, and funding decisions are not made under the auspices of Farmed Animal Funders. Um, Usually, I think, you know, they might have done some re-granting programs or pooled funding, but those are kind of a different conversation. So to answer this question, yes, funders do talk amongst each other, but there's not like cons conspiring. Um, I think actually many funders are often reluctant to share concerns or bad experiences with each other because they recognize that our movement is fairly small and these kind of sharing maybe bad interactions or experiences might not apply to other funders um, and you know they don't want to damage the reputation of organizations in our movement so there's a lot of caution around that um, I think there's an aspiration for funders to collaborate in practice funders actually aren't often the ones making the connections to bring funding together. It's often up to nonprofits to put together those kind of deals um, to say things like, you know, we're trying to raise X amount of money and we're trying to get four different funders in on this. Um, but if we don't get the full amount, you're not on the hook. So it's actually often nonprofits doing those kinds of bringing funders together to collaborate on funding an organization or a project than the funders themselves. Um, I'll also just share that like funders are not a monolith, as I shared before, each one has their own theory of change, their own ideas of what work is most impactful, and, and also the people working at foundations or, you know, in small funder organizations are individuals too, so they all have their own ideas. Um, I think instances where funders will definitely talk, there are a few, um, when there's a serious problem um, and there's a very sure certainty that a waste of resources is occurring in an organization. I don't think this happens very often. I have never seen it happen. Anything related to sexual harassment, um, do not try to hide that from your funders. Talk to your funders and get out ahead of it with them if you're dealing with that in your organization. Um, and I think in addition, when, and this does not happen often at all, when people seem to be looking out for themselves um, and not the movement, I think funders notice that. Um, you know, I think that it really goes a long way with funders, as we've said before, to be very gracious and have an abundance mindset and lift others up with you. Um, and if folks are kind of seem to be like out for themselves, that can sometimes leave a bad taste in, in funders' mouths. But in general, I think, you know, funders would like to collaborate on projects more than, than we do. And, you know, Tom and Veronica and I have collaborated on some really great work together, including this webinar, but um, I would not worry too much about funders conspiring uh, together in like a shady, uh, a shadowed room or anything like that. Yeah, we don't conspire, <laughs> not against you. <laughs> no, no, we are on the contrary. We want you to be successful. If so we, if we talk, it's because we wanna collaborate and make you successful, your work successful. So yeah, yes, we talk and and we collaborate. So and most of the time we will ask you for permission to to share a proposal with other organizations. Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, wow, this was incredible. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Deep sign, thank everyone. We made it through. Um <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Veronica, Tom, Lauren. I also have to just give a special thank you to Lauren for your very detailed um, support in terms of creating the outline and doing some of the outreach and research on these questions. Like you've been incredibly detail oriented and just really wanting to make this the best uh, event possible. And so thank you for each of you for being here, for putting in all of the time ahead of time to prepare and really make sure that your responses were so thoughtful and thorough. Yeah, this is an incredible resource to us all. I can see lots of thanks and praise coming in to the chat and, you know, keep it coming in, keep praising. And actually what